All right. Good morning, everyone. It's 8.08 a.m. on uh, Thursday, September 19, 2024. I'm uh, calling, the, calling to order the first meeting of the 2024 Charter Review Committee. Thank you all for uh, volunteering to serve on this really important committee. I think this is a historic meeting. This is the first time we're doing this. This is our first charter. Um, so I'm really excited to be working with you all and I thank you for your service. Um, I'm gonna go around and just confirm everyone can hear and be heard since we uh, have some folks on Zoom. So Andy, can you just hold down the button on your mic and say here or hello? Or here, hi. Meg? Present. Here. Julian? Present. Bernie? Here. Ken? Good morning. Erica? Good morning. Dan? I'm here. Raphael? Here. And we're missing Marcus. Um, so I'm just announcing that we're recording audio and video. The first thing we're going to do, if there's no objection before we um, elect a chair and vice chair, is just do a short icebreaker. I'm conscious that some of us um, don't have a lot of time this morning and we're starting a little bit late. Um, I was hoping to have a little bit more of a get to know you session, but I want to use our time wisely. So if you want to go around, introduce yourself, maybe say why you want to serve on this committee or talk about your previous service. Um, and then um, I invite you to say, an element, share an element of success that you've felt in the past. And that can be whatever comes up for you, making sure that you have a cup of coffee or a snack in the morning, making sure you're you know, communicating with, with people in a way that feels good for everyone or in a positive way or whatever you wanna share in that way. And I would just ask you to be lean of speech and keep your comments to a minute or two so that we can get to our other important items on the agenda. Um, so yeah. Um, just for um, so I can understand, can you say how this agenda was determined and, um, you know, tell us the process and also it's a lot of feedback. Um, uh, say what what the legal status of it is, is are we legally bound to this agenda or do we have any leeway in in this proceeding? So as your staff liaison, I um, put the agenda together after you elect a chair and vice chair will be the chair who determines what to put on the agenda. For this meeting only, we needed somebody to write an agenda and we don't have a chair yet. So I took on that task. Um, so we are bound to only discuss what's on the agenda today by the open meeting law, unless something comes up that was unanticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting. What would be in that category? Um, those are usually emergency things that really need attention at this point, because um, the purpose of the open meeting law is to make it transparent what the committee is going to be talking about. So the members of the public are informed when they come to the meeting. If something comes up that wasn't anticipated and isn't on the agenda, there may be members of the public who wish to attend and hear what you have to say about that topic and weren't informed. So it's wise, unless it's something really pressing that comes up to request that it be on the, the next agenda. And you would make that request to the chair once we have a chair. Um, and then you can discuss it publicly and members of the public know that it's gonna be on the agenda and discussed at that meeting. Um, Julian, you had your hand up and down. Did you have a question? Meg? Um, I think I brought this up within 48 hours of the meeting, but I feel quite strongly, I'd go with whatever everyone wants, but somewhat in line with your question. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it doesn't to me make sense to pick the permanent chair when we hardly know each other. There are only two people here who I've I know it all well, and one I've met. But um, so I'm just seems that we could have there's all sorts of mechanisms for a temporary chair if people wanted to do that. But I'm not sure that fits within the agenda. So sure. So when, when we get to the election of chair and vice chair, that's a motion that you can make to elect a temporary chair for however many meetings, a period of time. Right. I don't feel comfortably being the temporary chair because I'm not a member of the committee. So I would ask that you elect a temporary chair if that's what the committee chooses to do at that time um, among the members. Right. Okay. But there are ways to do that. So sure. Yeah. Especially so let's do it. Let's do started. introductions and then we'll get to that. started out that way. Yeah. The temporary chair. Yeah. Thank you. Introductions. I'm going to go around in the order that uh, folks are on my screen. Ken. Uh, my name is Ken LeBlond. Um, 
I live in the Echo Hill neighborhood of Amherst. I've been in Amherst for over 11 years. Um, I want to serve because I, um, I have a master's degree in public administration. So I've always been interested in kind of how government works um, kind of behind the scenes. Um, and while this is rather public, um, I think it also I think it also counts as kind of behind the scenes. Um, and that's the kind of job I actually have now um, with the University of Massachusetts. I'd say a, a sign of success for me would be to be able to end my each and every day with about a half an hour of book reading in bed. That is a perfect end to my day. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Hi, I'm Andy Churchill. I um, live up on Pine Street in North Amherst. Um, I've been here since 1995. Um, I worked in education as a uh, policy analyst and researcher and administrator for a number of years. I'm now retired. Uh, I do occasional consulting uh, jobs, but not very often. Um, and I've chaired, I, I served on the uh, school committee uh, for two terms, then I chaired the charter commission that um, we're now um, looking to uh, adjust the work of, and I'm excited about that. Um, success, uh, success would be if I could stay awake for half an hour reading a book uh, in bed, um, that would be great. Um, and I guess, you know, uh, I, I think feeling like I am doing something creative with my time and something useful with my time, I guess is my judgment of success. Thank you, Meg. I'm Meg Gage. Um, I'll, I made some notes, but I'll whip through it very fast. I retired um, from 35 years in progressive philanthropy about uh, eight or nine, 10 years ago. I founded the Peace Development Fund and the Proteus Fund, uh, national philanthropy organizations that are still based in Amherst, working on global peace, democracy, marriage equality, a range of democracy issues. Before that, I was a high school teacher for uh, I don't know, eight or 10 years, including four years at Amherst High which is also my alma mater. Um, in uh, the 90s, I led two or three, I can't remember, override campaigns, primarily focused on the schools, um, one of which with uh, Lynn's husband, Brian. Um, and I <clears throat> was the founding chair of the Amherst Cinema Board and served from when the, we bought the building in 2000 till 2010, which is one of my most successful things. Um, <clears throat> And I was in town meeting from 1987 until uh, 2017. Um, I'm very active in the League of Women Voters, particularly in the Racial Justice Committee. Um, I founded the uh, District One Neighborhood Association, of which I'm the president, which helps um, people in North Amherst participate in the community. And I was on the Charter Commission, which Andy led. And my big interest reason that I'm on this is I'm interested in expanding meaningful participation. And I have a lot of interest in think, talking about thinking about with us what meaningful means in terms of participation and transparency. I support the league's uh, recommendations and would be happy to send them to you or the league will probably send them. And they raise some questions that we don't have time now to bring up, but I'm interested in learning what others think about those recommendations and particularly whether we should even discuss issues beyond the limited range of what this review is in the scope of our work. Um, the, that document does do that. And so it's a, it's a strategy question of, do we want to um, focus only on the limited scope or do we wanna also open to the public some discussion about other issues related to our government that could be addressed in other ways down the road if that's what people think. So when I've had conversation- Meg, I'm gonna ask you to wrap up. Okay, thanks. Thank you on oh, a really success. I don't know, going to bed on time <laughs> in Amherst Cinema. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Good morning. Um, I'm Erica Midgelin, and I um, have lived in Amherst for uh, almost about uh, six or seven years. Um, I live in South Amherst. Um, I've my background is in uh, a variety of things, but mostly in the world of uh, media, uh, media production, and also as an educator. 
um, my areas of interest are uh, the intersection of media and democracy and media and society and so on. Um, currently, I work as a program officer for a nonprofit, so I I am interested. I'm very interested in process and systems and good systems for um, working with people. Um, and um, that was one of the things that interested me about coming to serve on this uh, committee was my interest in in process, both the details and the big picture and um, having something to contribute in the way of good process. Um, success, that's a, you know, that's a tricky one, but I would say it's not necessarily getting to the bottom of the to-do list at the end of the day, but maybe having a good sense of where, where you're going to start the next day. Thank you, Erica. Dan? So I'm Dan Muscat. I've lived here since uh, 96. And uh, I think I'll go right to the success part. That for me, a successful day is one where I've learned something. And I want to express my gratitude to the council because I've learned a lot over the last two months and I've really enjoyed it. And I expect that that will um, really continue. Um, and it's not just learning uh, ephemeral things, but things that seem um, really relevant to all of our lives. Um, so I'll keep it short at that. Thank you. Julian. So press and hold. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, my name's Julian. I grew up here in town, um, just graduated this year from Amherst Regional High School, and now I'm at UMass for environmental uh, conservation and community forestry. So uh, that's a little bit about me. I would say I'm hoping to work on this committee with sort of dividing things into having some sessions where we sort of delve into the smaller detail stuff um, and some sessions where we think mm -hmm. about the big picture. So we're able to consider both aspects of the issue, but also not be so intertwined like, okay, we want to remove this word while also thinking about should we have a mayor or a council or a this, right? We want to bring it back in to sort of be able to focus on, have some sessions with the small, some sessions with the sort of larger issues. Um, and then lastly, uh, success, I guess. I enjoy starting my mornings early, which is rare for teenagers, but I <laughs> I like uh, 6, 7 a.m. is a good start. Julian, we, we don't have anything in common. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bernie, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Bernie Kubiak. Uh, let's see. I, I worked for um, almost three decades in human services before changing careers. I'm a local government um, aficionado, uh, having been a selectman for 12 years in, in Belchertown, and then I moved to Amherst while I was still unindicted. <laughs> uh, so that 25 years ago, I, I, I moved to Amherst. Uh, I've managed to uh, run three towns, uh, all of which are smaller. But what you find when you run a small town is, is that you have to wear many hats and do many things because you really don't have an extensive staff. I have uh, a, a master's in education with an emphasis on special needs and a master's in, in um, public policy, although some people will tell you I'm a master of none. Um, <laughs> My uh, my hope here is on this committee is that we we stay focused on the, the, the what we've been asked to do by the council. I will say up front, I'm not interested at all in relitigating the form of government. I want to make focus on how well our form of government functions and where we can improve that because the voters chose this form of government. Um, for me, success is get waking up and finding a nice foggy morning where I can go out and make photographs. Thank you, Bernie. Raphael. Raphael Rogers. Um, I live, I've lived in South Amherst with my wife and daughter for over 20 years, taught in schools for a little while, um, Amherst, middle Amherst High School. Um, all in, weave in like successes throughout this. 25 years of marriage with my wife, success. Uh, raised a daughter in Amherst. She just got her master's from Northeastern success. Um, currently a part of the Jedi Library Committee. Um, 
And in terms of another success, recently submitted a book manuscript for publication about representation of Black girls in picture books, um, success. In terms of joining this committee, um, Amherst has given, given our family a lot, um, interested in giving back and being more civically engaged. Um, so good to see everyone. Thanks. Thank you everyone for sharing. The next item on our agenda is election of chair and vice chair. So uh, I had planned to run this election in the same way that I run the election for the president and uh, of the council. Um, if when we get into this, there's a motion to elect a temporary chair or a chair for a certain amount of time or a number of meetings, then, um, then we can do that. So uh, is there any discussion about this before we get into nominations and votes and so on? Um, yep. I, I support the idea of a temporary chair because I believe that, um, you know, people will, if, if this is the process we're about to do, people will submit statements, but to really get an assessment of whether someone should get my vote as a chair, I want to see them in action. I want to see what our process is and what um, what deliberation people show during that, because deliberation is such a, a prime value uh, stated in the charter. So I, I really think it's appropriate for our knowledge of each other to go beyond whatever three minute um, statement each candidate might offer. Okay. Are there any other comments? Meg. I agree. Um, I'm just curious how how I've, I've been on school committee, I've been on charter commission, and I've seen these things happen, and I don't remember exactly how people indicate whether they're interested or not interested in being the chair or the temporary chair. Okay, so um, if there are no objections from members, um, I'll ask how long you'd like to elect a chair and vice chair, and then um, I, I can walk you through the, the nomination and election process. Are there any suggestions about how long a term you'd like to elect a temporary chair? Two meetings? That's in. There's a suggestion for two meetings for a temporary chair. Are there any objections? Including this one? Trying to make it as fair as possible. I think two meetings counting this one, or what do you think? How often will we meet? Oh, that's we'll get into the schedule. Yeah, after this. That's well, two or three. A great question. Two or three. I would say three, including this one. Three, including this one. Any objections to three meetings, including this one? OK, so um, after we do nominations, I'll ask for a motion to elect a temporary chair for uh, two additional meetings. So um, the method we'll do the election is I'll open the floor for Nominations, you can nominate yourself if you wish. Um, I'll ask if you're not nominating yourself, if you accept the nomination. Uh, nominees make a brief statement. Um, then everyone else who's not a nominee can make a, a statement and then uh, we'll vote for candidates. You will vote for candidates. So uh, if there is not a majority vote, then we'll just repeat the process until we have five votes for a chair or a temporary chair, excuse me. Yes, Meg? Put in here. Sorry. Sorry. I nominate Julian. Julian, do you accept? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think um, um, we'll do statements afterwards. So I'm just sorry. looking for nominations. Thank you. Any other nominations? Since there are none, I'm looking for a motion to elect Julian Hines as a temporary chair for the next two meetings after today. So moved. Thank you, Bernie. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I'm gonna call for the vote. Meg? Aye. Um, Julian, I'll call, call on you last. Bernie? Yes. Ken? Yes. Erica? Yes. Dan? Yes. Raphael? Yes. Marcus is absent. Andy? Yes. Julian? Uh, all abstain. 
All right, Julian, I'm gonna hand the meeting over to you. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, I was not expecting this. <laughs> so uh, I can I can help you out. I'm here if okay, you help. Sure. So the, the next order of business is a vice chair. And Excellent. we can do the same thing if you'd like to elect a vice chair for the same period of time as we've sure. elected a chair. Um, I guess I'll first start with, I wasn't expecting to be chair, but that's okay. Um, and I'm not sure, but I hope my schedule would allow to continue afterwards. But if we find someone else who we want to do the job better, please go right ahead. I don't want to cut anybody off if they have an interest. Um, so I'll pull up the agenda here. Election of vice chair. Can I have nominations for vice chair? Move. Uh, we nominate. I nominate uh, Andy Churchill for vice chair. Okay. Um, other nominations. Um, right. Andy, part, point of order. Andy, do you accept? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yes. We're, neither of us are too enthusiastic. Yeah. Enthusiastic. <laughs> Acknowledgement. <laughs> so, any other nominations? Seeing none. Um, my next question is, do we want to... Um, my next question is, do we want to have this be a temporary vice chair for the same period of meetings, or do we want to have this be a permanent vice chair position? My, my motion was... Meg raised her oh, hand. What, what, temporary is what... Sorry. What did, could Press Bernie down your repeat button. what he said? Yeah, I, my understanding was it was a temporary chair for the same period of time. Okay. Vice chair, I, the same period of time. I support Great. that. Excellent. Okay. Sounds good. Um, then all in favor of AD... Oh. Whenever uh, we need a motion to elect a vice chair, uh, yep. Andy Churchill, for a period of two meetings after today. Okay, thank you. Um, so motion, moved. great. Is there a second? second? Second. Excellent. Okay. All in favor? Uh, can yes. we? Do we raise our hands or? No, we I'm sorry. We need to do a vote. A roll okay. call vote. Okay, yep. got it. Um, so then, I guess I'm just doing this randomly. No preference to anybody. Um, Meg, go ahead. Yes. Uh, myself. Yes. yes. Uh, Bernie? Yes. Um, Andy? Abstain. Uh, Ken? Yes. Uh, Dan? Yes. Raphael? Yes. Erica? Yes. And so now, Andy, congratulations. Ken. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't think you called on Ken. Oh, sorry, Ken. My bad. I think oh. I did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, great. Um, so congratulations, Andy. And uh, then I guess my next point here will be assignment of minutes. Who wants to take minutes for us? Um, if anybody wants to volunteer, I guess we can do it that way. Is that okay? You can have volunteers. You can decide if you want to do a, a rotating schedule okay. of volunteers or just go, you know, take turns, however you'd like to do it. Does anybody want to volunteer? I'm taking notes now, so okay. I'll I'll do it if you're today, comfortable. But maybe we can we can rotate vice chair and then so yeah, that's fine. My my suggestion would be that we rotate taking the minutes. I agree on that idea. I think it's a great idea. Do we want to? I agree. Okay, great. So do we want to just to try to do it equitably? Be like assign each meeting. Sort of maybe I could create a list and send it to Athena to send out to people of just each meeting. And sort of just go down, Andy. Then I guess we can go this way and around. Um, <laughs> I'll send that to Athena after the meeting. Uh, review of open meeting law, or no, meeting schedule. Meeting schedule. Okay. So, how often do we want to meet? When do we want to meet? What time do we want to meet? How do people's schedules work? I guess I'll call on other people before I talk. Go ahead. Could we ask Athena to sort of give us her experience on, on trying to schedule us, and if there are any, <laughs> if there are any late, you know, softer targets for scheduling? You've really tested the roots of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> if they were any less strong, I wouldn't have any hair left because scheduling this meeting was incredibly difficult. Your schedules are quite literally opposite of one another. So some members are available in the morning, others are available in the evening. And um, so this was 
literally the only time that I could get all nine of you in a room at the same time. So um, unless folks' schedules have become more flexible, um, this is the meeting time. I, if I am, Julian, you don't mind me making a, uh, giving an opinion, this is not an accessible meeting time for members of the public. I don't think uh, members of the public are gonna be able to participate in your meetings and follow along with what's going on at this hour. So my suggestion would be if this is your regular meeting time that you uh, consider holding listening sessions and public information sessions at a time that's more accessible like the evening. I just say I completely agree. In fact, I hope that this is not our regular meeting time and hope we can schedule meetings outside of the typical work day preferably in the evening. I agree. I'm wondering if the nature of people's conflict is uh, fixed in cement or people who can't meet, for example, in the evening or late afternoon. A good time, for example, for a lot of groups is four in the afternoon. If people have, I don't know whose schedule is what, but if people have any flexibility whatsoever who, can, who prevented us from meeting in the evening or in the late afternoon. Um, is anybody hand? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, my experience is that uh, town government in Massachusetts is nocturnal. <laughs> um, I, you know, it, I'm, I'm retired, so I have some, some degree of flexibility, uh, and can eat, meet in late afternoon, um, early evening outside of, uh, school vacation weeks and things like that. Um, so, um, you, you know, it's, that's a possibility, but I think we need to, uh, we all need to stretch a little bit to, to make this schedule work. And I, uh, um, I, I it, 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 Athena also has her master's in public policy and I did note in a, in a I sent her a note saying that none of us who've taken an MPA program have had any experience with cat herding. So <laughs> this becomes a more of a challenge. And, And I would I would prefer a, an early evening just because of parental responsibilities and getting kids to extracurricular activities and picking them up and so forth. Um, that that four o'clock time is right in the midst of everything, really, uh, for me, just personally. So more in the early evening, the six o'clock sort of time is a lot more doable. Go ahead. Are we anticipating two hour meetings? Are we looking for a two hour slot? I would assume I think two hours is a reasonable amount of time. I don't want to keep people here for longer than that. Um, I guess one comment, or uh, no, Erica, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Um, one question that I think might be relevant to this is how, is the frequency of meeting? Are, are we talking about uh, you know six o'clock one night a week for um, like every week, or are we? What's the cadence of our meeting schedule? I guess that would be up for the committee to decide. I would personally advocate for a biweekly meeting schedule. Once every two weeks seems appropriate. Go ahead, Meg. Um, just to try to zero in, um, are there people who are not able to meet in the early evening? Then we'll get to how frequently we would do that. But so that seems to be a time that from the people who've spoken, works so after kids afternoon activities um, or six or seven in that range six to seven range on evenings usually works for me dan i mean i also think that our essential business or part of it is engaging the public so that listening sessions is a plan is a distant plan b we really I think have an obligation to, oops, make it available. This the times we're talking about, and I will certainly, uh, I can clear my schedule to make that happen. Could here's a thought: Could we do alternating weeks? Yeah. Should we check first if there are other people who can't do evenings? Yeah, that's a good idea. If it's the same time every time, however frequently, it's just easy to remember. Raphael. I can do evenings, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday and Wednesday of standing meetings. 
or clap. Got, got it. Um, so it seems like for everybody I've heard, at least six, six, seven p.m. on evenings, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday works. Um, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Sorry. Is that a reference to me? Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Got it. Um, I personally sometimes have another meeting, which I'm responsible for on Tuesdays and sometimes Thursdays. Um, but if we did six to eight o'clock on Thursdays, that would work for me. How does that work for other people? I don't want to. Sounds good. That would work. So could I, I guess we should probably check with Marcus, who's not here, but I guess temporarily, could I make a motion to meet Thursdays biweekly from 6 to 8 p.m.? Excellent. Second. Um, so I guess I'll start with Ken. Agree. Excellent. Um, Dan? Agreed. Bernie? Yes. Uh, Andy? Yes. Meg? Yes. Erica? Yes. Uh, Raphael? Yes. Excellent. So that is our <laughs> meeting time. Um, thank you, Athena. <laughs> that was a lot easier than my experience. Thanks. Um, one, one other point, um, Julian, is the format. So um, I'm not sure that I'll be able to support an in-person or a hybrid meeting in this format. So I'd like to ask the committee if they're comfortable meeting on Zoom. Some days um, I can accommodate some hybrid meetings some days, but I, I don't think that I can commit to um, doing this whole thing every other week okay. at that time. Yeah, I mean, I'm personally, I don't have a problem meeting on Zoom. Um, I guess if that's okay with everybody else, we can meet on Zoom. Um, or maybe we could, yeah. I didn't mean yeah, to go interrupt. Ahead. No, go right ahead. I just, I mean, it, my my assumption is we're going to be wanting the public to be participating in our meetings, and if it's just on Zoom, that is that now an accepted way of doing meetings as opposed to hybrid for participation? If I may, go ahead. Um, we've had an explosive number of participants since we began meeting on Zoom. It's been far more accessible. Folks who have kids who are home in the evenings are able to listen in um, rather than trying to get here and find you know, childcare or bring their kids. And um, so in my experience, we've had far greater engagement um, since we started Zoom meetings. And um, if I were to advocate one meeting, one way or another would be to either meet on Zoom or meet in a hybrid way so that people who um, have scheduling conflicts can attend. Bernie? Yeah, I think um, I, I'm a member of the International City Managers Association still. Um, and I think the ICMA data bears out what Athena said that, you know, having being being able to access meetings remotely really does increase participation. Uh, it's varied over from community to community, but overall it's up. Um, my preference would be that we, we you know, we inter, inter, uh, inject a face-to-face a -face meeting from time to time, just so we can see each other and check in with each other and... and um, I find that uh, uh, you know Zoom is sort of like Hollywood Squares to date myself. Um, I, I get a much better feel for what people have to say and and, and how they uh, react when I actually can see the whole person or at least most of the person, uh, not just the head, on <laughs> neck and shoulders. Um, so that's it. Um, the Zoom meetings are fine. I think they they do bring people in, but like I said, I would like from time to time to have a an in in-person meeting. I would, yeah, go ahead. No, go right ahead. Um, I agree with Bernie. I just slightly tweak that too. I, I, hybrid meetings have all the benefits of participation of full Zoom meetings that we have as many hybrid meetings as we can so that we get as much face-to-face -face time. It's just a completely different kind of meeting when we can look across. And, um, so I support both, but I, as many hybrid meetings as, as Athena can handle. 
I guess here's a yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, I mean, my preference is in person, but I also we live in the world we live in. Um, and so when you say you can't support it, is it that this Am I on? Okay. Um, if it's a technical thing that you are the person that would have to, um, you know, arrange the meeting and you simply can't, and you're the only person that can do it, that would be an obstacle. But I do, I, I think the face-to-face -face thing matters. I also, I've, of course, people will come who, who can't physically make it. So the, the virtue of both seems to me, um, it should be included in what we do as much hybrid as we can. Yeah. Um, Erica, then Athena. Erica, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I uh, just wanted to say personally, um, for accessibility reasons, I am unable to meet in person. And it's important to me that we figure that into the the um the calendar um i understand what everyone is saying about the value of being face to face i certainly miss it i would like to be there in person it's just not possible so i think that um and also i would extend that to the larger accessibility issue that was brought up earlier about making this meeting available for the largest possible input um from all kinds of people who have both you know a s schedule health mobility, any kind of accessibility issue, a virtual option is, I think, critically important. So hybrid, I understand the the, um, the intensity of resources that it takes to make a hybrid meeting. Athena, I'm, I'm speaking to you, so I, I get that, but I think that it has a value that we can, um, if we don't want to meet 100% virtually, having a, having a having a hybrid meeting schedule so that it's periodic and people can anticipate when those resources have to be expended, I think is useful. Athena? Yeah. Um, Dan, I appreciate your comment about um, my availability, uh, but it, it isn't just me. There are staff who have to open the building and close the building, make sure that the building is secure after our public meetings. So um, there are, like Erica said, a number of resources that we use when we have in-person or hybrid meetings. So um, I appreciate that you'll keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I'll just say a few process things. First, I sent you the minute taker designation. Secondly, just a question is for folks who don't have a computer, can they call into the Zoom meetings? Yes. So when we have Zoom meetings, you can connect via Zoom or you can call in using a telephone number and a webinar ID. Okay. So folks who have a phone can do that. That's what makes it a little more accessible. Second or third is would it be helpful for folks if I screen shared the agenda on Zoom? where we're going, so to speak. Um, Do you mean right now or in general? In general oh. and now. <laughs> in in general, my experience has been that it's really helpful to share documents as we're working on them or as a committee's okay. working on them. So when there is, you know, in my experience with the, with the council, we often share the agenda at the beginning of okay. the meeting or the president will go over the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Got it. Um, and then if there are relevant documents that we're discussing, then it's helpful to have those on okay. screen and I can help with that. Perfect. I will... Um, share the agenda in future meetings at the beginning of the meeting. And then um, we, I can, you or I can sh screen share documents we're working on, depending on who has them pulled up. Um, but for now, I'll just keep it as is. Um, Julian, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so um, to someone mentioned having a regular schedule of uh, hybrid meetings so that members of the public can anticipate when we'll do that. I can work with um, the, the committee and the, the chair when we have an, a, a permanent chair to develop a schedule so that we know which meetings are going to be in a hybrid format and which are going to be Zoom. We can look, look, at, look ahead and get those on our calendars. Yeah. How do folks feel about maybe doing mostly Zoom meetings and then hybrid meetings in this room once a month? Yeah. Yeah. Um, be before uh, you make that commitment, 
Can can we come back to that at the next yeah. meeting and, and talk fine. about a sure. more specific format schedule yeah, at the next meeting? That's fine. My, my previous comment about um, town government in New England being nocturnal. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Oh, oh. time. <laughs> you speak into your mic. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> limited number. Yeah, I got it right here. Um, there's a lot of people trying to use the same resources at the same time. Um, and it's not simply a question of, of uh, Athena's ability to schedule herself. She already stretches herself quite thin. So um, we, we have to be cognizant of that. And it used to be for me that Thursdays were a safe night for social stuff. Not anymore, <laughs> because all the other committees and everything else I'm part of, you know, the Mondays are out automatically, um, and then everything gets piled into the rest of the week. So, um, you know, let's be careful about, uh, let, let's give Athena the opportunity to tell us how viable a, a hybrid meeting schedule is. Um, and just yeah. one more thing, if I may. Yeah. Um, I'll also need to check and make sure this room is available okay. on the dates. So uh, Got it. It, that's why I'm I'm looking yep. to come back. Just yep. want to make okay. sure that we sounds good. We can do everything we need to on those nights. Meg, nights. and then I think I'll wrap up this discussion. I just want to be sure that we agreed on one aspect of our schedule, which is that generally the meetings will end at eight. Um, and there was a I think, for example, you could we could have a policy that no new subject will be brought up after before. Eight o'clock, or yeah, I don't mind how we do it, but I think if we're in the middle of a discussion, it's suddenly eight o'clock. You can't say, "Well, now the meeting's over," but that in general we're going to use whatever tools we have to have two-hour meetings because, as I understand it, this review committee doesn't have a time limit, and we're not likely to have things come up that are uh, time sensitive. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think people stop functioning after a two-hour meeting. I completely agree. I think, uh, like, obviously, if a discussion's continuing, it sort of makes sense to continue. But if we can agree be after 745 to not bring up new or unanticipated issues on the whole, that would be much appreciated. Uh, Dan? Okay. Agree. Oh, okay, great. Andy? Uh, <clears throat> There was the question about whether we have a time limit or not. Do, do Is our charge over at any particular time? Do we have to finish by a year from now or what? There is a reporting requirement in a year, um, but you can ask to, the council can extend your deadline. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I guess, um, I guess we'll call it as we've set our meeting schedules for Thursday, 6 to 8 p.m., um, we set a cutoff at 745 for new topics and we'll meet biweekly, probably over Zoom and possibly schedule hybrid meetings as that works for members of the committee, Athena and the staff people who work here. And so your next meeting will be on Zoom on October 3rd. Excellent. Thank you. At 6, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Great. Um, and that will be posted to the town website like this. So... Moving on to our next agenda item is review of open meeting law. Would you like to cover that, Athena, or should I? Um, I, I plan to do a little bit more of an extensive review of the open meeting law since there are some members who are new to public meetings. Um, I'm just aware of the time, and, and we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I can briefly answer questions and then okay. maybe schedule a little bit more of an in-depth conversation. Specifically for the people who are new or for everybody? For anyone, questions about the open meeting law continue to come up with members who serve for years and years. So, um, you know, now or at any time, I can answer questions about the open meeting law. Briefly, you can't dis discuss committee business with a quorum of members outside an open meeting. And that includes discussing that business with one member and then sharing that member's opinion with another and then sharing that member's opinion with another five members is a quorum. Um, and so um, Megan asked for email addresses and your email addresses are not mine. So I was hesitant to share anyone's email addresses. I'll leave that up to you. And I'm gonna caution you to not discuss any committee business on email. Um, if you wanna get to know each other or anything like that, that's fine. Um, but your 
emails that have anything to do with committee uh, business are public records. So anything that you put in writing, you should be aware, could be read by anyone who requests your records. Um, Bernie, you, you- Yeah, I was gonna say the good rule to follow is never hit reply all. Unless you're talking about scheduling a meeting. You know, Which we just did. You know, so so email communication around scheduling a meeting is okay. Beyond that, don't hit reply. You'll notice I, I BCC'd <laughs> everyone on every single email that I've sent the committee so far, and that's specifically to avoid that issue. So I assume, and we correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume that also means just like don't go email one person about committee business or meet with one person about committee business and then even though you quote unquote just met with that one person, share it with a bunch of other committee people. That's correct. Exactly. Okay, right. great. Um, and so any opinions you have, you don't want to share with five members. Exactly. You know, I think we should do things this way and I'm going to talk to five members about it. You violated yeah. the open meeting law, even if it's a phone call. Right. Um, and particularly emails, it's such a slippery slope. You have people's emails and you want to talk and share ideas and so forth. And so- like call Bernie one person said, and then the next soon enough you're up to five exactly great dan but but the to serially speak with people while not actually discussing in other words okay i want to see what you think i want to see what you think and i'm not being a conduit for um for discussion that's acceptable no it's not no just it, gauging opinion and not 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 debating or deliberating or deciding no okay so if you're you have an idea and you want to share it with folks, you have to do that at a meeting. And you know the, the point of the open meeting law is that those thoughts, ideas, and opinions about the business that you're doing are open to members of the public. The members of the public want to understand and hear your deliberation process. They want to understand the conversations you have, the opinions people have, and the public have a right to see that happen in person. Um, and so... No, you don't want to, you know, take take a, a temperature of the committee outside a, a meeting at all. Generally speaking, if I bump into anyone on Main Street, talk about, I don't know, the weather, how your family is, not the committee. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Erica. I realize I look at my computer, which has the agenda, and I don't see your hand. So go right ahead. That's okay. Um, thanks for recognizing. I, I wondered if Athena or anyone else could address the, how the open meeting law impacts the formation of an agenda. Um, if if uh, agenda items can be added by communicating with the chair 48 hours in advance, how does that how does that work? Julian, if I may, go ahead. Um, so that gets into the rules a little bit. And there was a question from one member of the committee about the rules. Um, the, the charter requires that boards and committees adopt rules. I don't think anyone has done that besides the council. Um, so this committee, we, you know, we use Robert's rules as a default. Um, this committee can adopt rules. You can, you know, adopt certain council rules if you want to run things that way. You can just say we're going to use Robert's rules um, if an issue comes up that we need a ruling on. Um, usually it's the chair ruling and then the the other members would object or vote if if that came up. It, I don't imagine we'll have any issues that contentious, um, but that would be the case. So uh, the process for setting the agenda isn't really addressed in the open meeting law, Erica. It's uh, the chair sets the agenda. Members of the committee can request the chair place an item on the agenda, and that would be appropriate, say, if we were at a meeting, uh, a member wanted to discuss something specific, um, the chair could say, okay, I'm going to put that on the next meeting agenda, and we can discuss it then. Rather than having a discussion on a topic that wasn't on the agenda for that meeting, you place it on the next meeting agenda. So requests to put items on the next meeting agenda would be directed at the chair and then uh, discussed at the next meeting. Did that answer your question? It, it does. Thank you. It's helpful. I just wondered if, uh, for instance, emailing is out for that sort of thing. Requests to put something on an agenda and, and right. it, it will be up to the chair if, um, you know, how email addresses are shared and so forth, but a request to the chair to place something on the agenda for discussion at the next meeting is appropriate. Bernie. Okay. Yeah. When, when I was on the committee to review the town's bylaws, um, that was chaired by Bob Ritchie. So you, you don't get better than Bob when it comes to this stuff. Bob would allow uh, individual committee members to email him with uh, 
a an agenda item or email him with information that they would like to have shared at the next meeting rather than you know shotgunning it out to every I just found this great article shotgun it out to everybody on the committee you shouldn't do that the chair can pick and choose it's really up to the chair if the chair refuses to put an item on the agenda then a member can raise that at a meeting and the and the committee of, of a whole can override the chair and say yeah we're going to discuss this maybe not now but at the next meeting uh, and using robert's rules again that was bob's uh, bob handed us all a little robert's rules uh I have and, copies if anyone's interested. Robert's rules is yes, like this. The, I have an in brief the, that's also not the very condensed. Good. The, the readers, the readers' digest version. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> rather than create rules, Roberts is fine. So I know we're trying to wrap this up. I'll just say one thing: is we've agreed to not bring stuff up pre meetings, like before seven forty five, bringing up topics. Then we've also agreed to work on Roberts rules to an extent. And um, and that sort of thing. I'm gonna say Meg, then Andy, um, and then I'm gonna try to move us on to our next agenda item. But if people have burning questions, go ahead. Conversations raised a question for me about open meeting law, which I've been trained in, and so on. I'll just give it as quick example. So um, I spoke at the beginning, of, introduced myself, and Bernie did, and I think. I was misunderstood and I wanted after the meeting go over to Bernie and say, I didn't mean I want to, in this case, relitigate town, the town structure. Um, I was misunderstood. What I meant was blah, blah, blah. That would be violating open meeting law. Um, just your comments that you made earlier? Just to correct, to, to, to refine what I said so that it didn't, that Bernie understood what I, I don't want to do it right now, but um, if I walked over to him after the meeting and said, just to clarify what I meant, Oh, no, just if you said that to one member, that wouldn't be an okay. issue. Andy? Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we want to have a section of agendas where we we would be able to raise agenda items for the next meeting, you know, at the end of each meeting so that we don't have to worry worry mm -hmm. about emailing and wondering. And then, I mean, I guess the chair's, it's still the chair's privilege, but. Like a sort of at the end of meetings, rather than bringing stuff up and discussing the issues, say topics that we would like on the next agenda or yeah. next agenda planning mm -hmm. as like a item nine. Yeah, that's perfectly acceptable. Could you include that, Athena? Yep. Great. And then just continuing that, um, we talked about not starting new top topics after 745. I would assume that we could vote to extend that if we had something particularly pressing or, you know, of the majority of people wanted to go later. So yeah, that... yeah, I mean, we, we'd, we'd have to vote on it in the moment, but I assume, yeah. Okay. Um, but as a general rule. Um, then I guess moving us to, oh, I had a question on it actually. So I've seen the town council like call recesses and stuff. Mm -hmm. From an open meeting law perspective, if we were to ever call a recess on this committee, people can or cannot go out in the hall and talk with other members, et cetera. So five of you cannot go out in the hall and continue having a meeting during a recess. Recesses are typically, you know, you, we need to take a break. There's a question about meeting procedures and we need to pause for a moment to clarify or, you know, we're having a technical issue. There's some other reason we need to take a break. It's absolutely not to have continue a meeting in a private way. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. And um, I'm just seeing, oh, we have more attendees. Excellent. Um, so we now have six attendees plus two in person. Um, and so I guess I'll move on to the next agenda item number seven, unless anybody, oh, sorry, Raphael, go right ahead. Yeah, I reached out to Athena. I have to exit. Um, so good to see you all. See you at the next meeting. Thanks. Okay. Um, have a great day. Sorry about that. Uh, well, let's try to wrap up the rest of this quickly. So I had put a brainstorming session on this um, agenda. You don't need to take that up since we, we don't have all the yeah. members here if you want, but we do need to include a period of public, public comment at every meeting. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, because Raphael and Marcus aren't here, I don't feel good about 
not including um, them in the brainstorm committee's work plan. If folks have a small, short thing they'd like to say about it, I'll. Or this could be an opportunity for those future agenda items. Yeah. If people want to make future agenda items, that sort of thing. Now's the time, uh, Andy. I think it might be helpful for us to get um, just a maybe a legal opinion, a clarification of what exactly our charge is, what we can change, and specifically what can this committee change or with the vote of the council, what could be changed with the vote of the legislature or with a new charter commission and sort of sort that out for us so that we know um, what we're, you know, what, what, what the parameters are. And then <clears throat> I would imagine that it could be, be possible for us to address each of those categories, but um, th the question would be then, are we presenting, I mean, I think a lot of our work is going to be outreach and trying to get a sense of what, how people in and out of government feel like it's working. So if we are presenting our findings, are we presenting recommendations from this committee or are we presenting, here's what we've heard without judgment. And so, and that might change, that might vary depending on whether um, it's something that the council can specifically do versus something that would require a broader effort. So I, I don't, I don't know what that item yeah. is, but I think no, that, it, that's our charge and what's the parameters. I see an issue with putting that on the next agenda. Um, we can have an, like, what is our charge board? What is our scope of work type discussion? Sort of agree on that as a committee presume not vote on it, maybe get legal advice, um, or we can get in our own outside consultants to discuss. Um, Bernie, then Raphael, or excuse me, Dan, um, did you have your hand up? Okay, um, so I'm gonna go Bernie, Dan, Meg. Yeah, I, I think a review of our charge and an agreement on what is our charge, not a sort of, but an absolute agreement on what our charge is, is, is important. Um, we have uh, KP Law, who is the town council. So if KP Law can offer some guidance between, between now and the next meeting, that would be helpful. If we have questions about uh, the legal questions about the charter or our charge, that goes to KP Law because they represent the town as a whole. Um, and it's a very competent law firm. I've worked with, I, I, I'm happy that they're our, our council. So just to make that clear, I mean, it, it really, we really need, before we go any further, we need to agree on where the, what, the, what the parameters are. <laughs> and then um, in terms of, of outreach and brainstorming, I'd like to, I, I don't know how, uh, it might be best to do this. Then if you have any ideas, please um, share them. Uh, I'd like to have uh, some mechanism for, for randomly sampling voters in the community and asking them questions, whether that's a written questionnaire, whether that's a telephone interview, whether that's a focus group, because I'm tired of hearing from the usual suspects. Um, I'm very encouraged to hear you each say this because we're a committee working under the law about the law and we do have to have, there can't be any, this has to be you know decided definitively. I want to tie this into an idea I had about the, about open meeting and content and that's we establish like a little library that's accessible online of things that we have turned to. And for instance, we can find other communities that have been in the exact place we've been in that changed from town meeting to council manager or council mayor and see their first reports like Bridgewater did this. Watertown has been doing this for 40 years for people to be able to see their reports and really look at the way that they've addressed this exact question. Some of them have really laid the law out very specifically for everyone, both us and the public who's interested to have access to those documents, I think would be very much in the spirit of open meeting law, that these are, this is our background information that in addition to uh, a lawyer's perspective, this is, these are how other people have referred, referenced the law. 
And some of them do it in a really very clear and compelling way. I think that would be invaluable for us to all have in front of us as we uh, wish to. Meg? Um, Sorry, I can't hear. I strongly agree with the spirit of what's been said. We need to know our charge, and uh, particularly with uh, when I've talked earlier about meaningful participation, that has to be representation of who lives here, not just the people who have the time to come to meetings and write letters to the editor. Um, related to that, do we have a budget? Because we're talking about consultants or using polling. You know, these things cost money. And I'd imagine Cape Shaw also costs the town quite a bit of money. So I agree. I think we should set out, like, can we use town resources aside from this room in Athena? Or, <laughs> and if not, how much does that cost? And being cognizant, you know, outside of just our committee, if things are going to cost a lot of money, maybe we should shy away from do, doing that thing or seeking that advice. Bernie has a hand up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go right ahead. No. Um, local government, in addition to being nocturnal, is also frugal. Um, so I would like to point out that the Mass Municipal Association's uh, mass managers have a form of government committee that's consulted for free right. to towns all around the state. Um, I served on the FOG <laughs> uh, at one point in my uh, humble career as a uh, town manager. Uh, the other thing that I would point out is that we have a couple of people here with um, master's degrees in public policy, and UMass has uh, a public policy program, and they've got some talented uh, faculty, and they've got some talented students, and one of whom I won't mention, uh, who's written about politics in Amherst uh, that we can uh, we can call on uh, as 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 consultants. Let me just be clear, if we were to use KP law, that would cost the town something. Um, okay, so we can use them as the, needed. The, the, so committee members can't directly okay. call our attorneys um, if there are specific questions. And then I will reach out and ask them for an overview of the process and okay. our specific legal parameters. Um, but you don't have personal access to KPA. Okay. Uh, it does cost money for them to prepare memoranda Something. and so okay. on. The okay. the committee itself doesn't have a budget. Um, I could, I will absolutely work with the committee to see you know what resources we have available and what right. we can do. There's a grant opportunity for this okay. process. If I'm able to apply for the grant and receive some funds that way, then we can. Um, yeah. Act, you know, spend those so, funds. And then there's also the the Collins Center that does some of this work for communities throughout the state. Okay. So um, there, are, there are some opportunities. So it might be better to re look into like what Bernie was mentioning um, before we go to KP law. Regardless, I'm just gonna try to wrap this up, but go ahead. Um, I think that this is an important um, legal task that we're, the town's required to do. Um, KP law was helpful in preparing the charter and coming and giving us um, legal opinions, and I think they would be helpful in giving us the scope of of our work. Um, and then we can see, I mean, my, my suggestion would be then that we use their expertise and have the fact that they're on retainer and that they work with the town to help us understand our scope. And then going forward, we can say, you know, maybe if we get a grant, maybe we, we use that for, for more expensive things, but we're going to need some resources for you know, if we're holding forums and we need refreshments, or if we are, you know, if there's a consultant on a particular type of question that we have, uh, you know, I, I'd rather get it right than be than be dependent completely on volunteers. Yeah, um, Erica. Um, I think that what this leads me to is that perhaps a first item of business or a top of agenda for our next meeting is really identifying what has been written down for the scope of work for this committee, what is our charge, and what are our remaining questions um, so that they can be referred to whoever they need to be referred to, whether it's uh, an outside counsel or other kinds of expertise or other other 
sources, references, et cetera. Um, but having some well-formulated questions about what what is and isn't in our purview, what is and isn't uh, a kind of our jurisdiction, so to speak, as a committee, um, could be a, a useful discussion to have at the top, other than beyond also the other item I'd like to see on our agenda wow. is a sort of procedural discussion of the nature of our work and how we're going to go about it and all of the various components that we will take into consideration to do whatever that charge is. I, yeah, I agree. I think that's great. Um, so for the next agenda, we'll definitely have some review of open meeting law, a discussion of sort of where our jurisdictional boundaries are, what we can do, what we can't do, that sort of thing. Athena? Um, so to use our town resources wisely when we're reaching out to KP law, it, it does cost, they, we have them on retainer, but it does cost us every time we ask them to prepare new memoranda. So I can ask for a, a general memo on the scope of the committee charge and the powers of the committee. The committee charge itself is in the, the meeting packet and posted online. So I'd ask you to review that. There are specific things about um, what the committee, you know, develop and deploy a variety of feedback mechanisms. There's su some just suggestions about those feedback mechanisms feedback mechanisms and so on. Okay. Um, but I would ask that your questions, uh, specifically legal questions, you know, we have, we don't have ongoing requests for memos from KP law. We try to, you know, collect the questions and then maybe we have an opportunity to, to meet with one of our attorneys later um, for further questions or something. But, you know, requesting memos again and again just isn't a good use of our resources. I, I completely agree. So let's, we're, I feel like we're bordering on this place where after Dan or after Raphael left and I don't know why I confused the two of you um, after Raphael left and Marcus isn't here, we're having a fairly substantial discussion. That being said, I think that next meeting we can discuss this and we can decide, do we want to go forward seeking with the Collins Center? Do we want to go with KP law? What do we want to do, et cetera? I think that's an appropriate discussion for the next meeting when we're trying to decide our scope. I don't want to make a decision on that now without everyone here. Um, I would rather include everybody in that conversation, not get memos from KP law in advance or do something I'm not even sure all of us agree on. Andy, Dan. Yeah, if I understood Erica's suggestion that we would use the next meeting to collect all of our questions about our scope and that we would then give those to KP Law before they prepare anything and then they could give us something for the next meeting. Does that sound, is that what other people heard? That sounds more reasonable. I don't know if we want to use, like, do is KP Law the right place to direct those questions, or do we want to have an outside person like the Collins Center, et cetera? To clear, just to clarify, that was what that was what I was suggesting was that that decision about whether or not to use that expensive resource is the result of an actual conversation about this about what we do know about our charge. And yeah. In, in the next meeting. I feel like we've decided to develop a list of questions and discuss it at the next meeting. Whether we use KP law for that list of questions, I think should still be a discussion of the committee given the cost resources that it takes. Yeah, I, I think we should utilize KP law when there are questions of legality. And, and then in terms of best practices and what other communities outreach efforts have been, how their deliberative process has been in terms of forming the reports and recommendations and so on. Um, that's where I think a consultant call and center or, and other sources would be um, a better better use. KP Law can you know give their experience, but I think we should rely on them mostly for our legal questions. I agree. Yeah, go ahead. I think one of the questions I've really had you know, meeting you all, what are we all looking at? What statutes are we looking at just to see? Because it may be we're all looking at the same things and agree that um, that would be a starting point, that, 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 that there isn't a need. Oh, my God, we can't look at the same things or can't uh, see the same meaning. So we do need the outside. So it may be that this isn't um, as urgent. And that will come out in this, in this discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything everyone said. I just want to 
pull off one thing Andy said a while ago, which was while we have a li fairly limited scope of what we can address, if we're hearing from the public concerns of other sorts, it doesn't prevent us from reporting that. This is people were concerned about whatever, whatever. Again, though, we have to be sure we're hearing from a range of the public and not just the people who Thanks. keep saying the same thing. Steps. There was a question about legal statutes, um, just to, to get you started for some nighttime reading. Um, Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 43B, Section 10, addresses amendments to charter previously adopted or revised. Um, that's, that's a good, it's uh, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 43B, Section 10. You can put that into Google. It'll come right up as your first uh, awesome. your search yeah, sure, that item. Yeah, minute. So um, it's it's also, um, it's in your committee charge. It's it's uh, mentioned in your committee charge. So you can, if you lose track of it, find it there. Excellent. Other questions, comments, concerns on this brainstorming committee work plan and setting the agenda for the next meeting? We know a discussion about the scope of the committee will certainly be on that agenda. Not seeing anybody. Um, okay, uh, public comment. Um, moving us along to public comment. Oh, sign up sheets. Um, public comment, uh, I think I'll start in the room and then I will take people online. I would say, given how many people we have, we have 13 online, two in the room. Uh, Three minutes is fine. Come up to the mic, state your name, your district or where you live and your public comment. And uh, other than that, I guess that also would remind me if us as members of the committee could try to keep our remarks and stuff to three minutes as well. That seems to make it fair for the public. So that keep that in mind. If someone's rambling, I will try to uh, let you guys know. Um, but folks in the public, I'll start in the room and then go to Zoom. So if you want to say on Zoom, you can raise your hand. Yeah. And then in the room, you can just raise your hand. We, we don't have a lot of people, so I didn't yeah. do a sign-in sheet. Um, on Zoom, raise your hand. In person, I got you. Um, you have any? Great. Um, anyone on Zoom, please raise your hand. Not seeing anybody on Zoom. So Lynn, your time. <laughs> Good morning. My name morning. is Lynn Griesmer. I live at 83 Flat Hills Road, and it has been my honor and privilege to be on the town council for the last six years. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for stepping forward. This is a really important job and one that I know based on the conversation we've heard today and the interviews we did in selecting you that you all will take most seriously. So I just want to congratulate your temporary chair, your temporary vice chair, and all of you for joining this meeting. And at some point, I am sure that individual counselors, past and present, will weigh in. I don't intend to, to do that today, but I'm sure at some point I will. I just wish you luck, and I look forward to the education that not only you will have, but I will have about what we can change, what we can't change, and what the public would like us to do. Thank you. We are in reverse role, but thank you for your comment, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead. State your name and district or address. My name is Andy Anderson. I live in District 5. Uh, as some of you know, I have been a longtime supporter of ranked choice voting, which was included in the original charter and expected to be used with our town council and its multi-member districts because we removed preliminary elections for them. Uh, it was, it was a, uh, given to a charter or a ranked choice voting commission as part of the charter process. They came up with a solution. The town council was supposed to adopt these this solution as bylaws to implement ranked choice voting. They instead chose to send it to a legislature. The legislature has now for two sessions sat on it and did almost nothing with it. 
Uh, it's pretty clear that the legislature wants nothing to do with it and is not ever going to approve it. So uh, it has been suggested to me that possibly this committee uh, recommendations could include that and the town could then, town council could approve that, give it to the voters uh, for a second consideration. Um, this is gonna be a legal question because Constitution says modes of election can't be processed this way, but um, it's been two elections already. We're facing a third council election without the use of this important procedure. So I hope that this is something you can consider and prioritize and get out the door to the council before your final report so that possibly it um, gets processed um, or gets put before the voters um, as soon as possible. Um, so that's sort of the, the question here, and I hope that this is something that uh, you all will prioritize, um, uh, sort of separate from everything else. Um, again, you don't have to do anything. The Rating Choice Voting Commission has produced a wonderful document that just has to be um, uh, voted on in general. So I uh, hope that's a uh, something that you will uh, Put forward uh, in your agenda uh, for uh, uh, rapid consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much for your concerns. I appreciate it. Um, have you jotted that down for the minutes? Thank you. Awesome. Um, public commenters in the room, that's it. Anyone on Zoom, raise your hand. Last call, not seeing anybody. Nobody on Zoom? Okay. Um, I'm not seeing anyone on Zoom who'd like to comment. I did have one question about public comment, Athena. Mm -hmm. I know on some committees that I serve on, we have discussion with the public when they come for public comment, and committee members are welcome to ask questions, dialogue, et cetera. And I know the council does the opposite of that. They don't have dialogue with the public. Is there any rules on where our committee stands? Is that a decision for our committee to make? How is that approached? It's a, it's a balancing act. So say, for example, a member of the public brings up a topic that was not listed on the agenda. Um, if the committee wants to get into a discussion about that specific topic, it's wise to hold that to the next meeting so that it can be listed on the agenda and members of the public who are also interested in that item can come and speak. Um, if it's about what you're already talking about, then um, you might answer questions. Um, we as the council doesn't engage in a public dialogue, I think in terms of transparency, it's helpful to have specific meetings geared toward sharing information, having a dialogue, collecting feedback, rather than trying to have those conversations at a meeting. And that's, you know, not just the open meeting law, but just meeting management in general. Um, if we include every member of the public in your deliberations, then I think it blurs the line between who's sitting on the committee and members of the public. It's your responsibility as committee members to do this work. And I think if um, you know it's unclear who is doing what, then that becomes a murky situation. And you know, your conversation can get unmanageable if if you're having a back and forth. Um, so uh, the the open meeting law doesn't require a period of public comment, that's in our charter. Um, and if you were to adopt rules similar to what the, the council rules are, then um, you would, that's methods of regulating public comment. Um, there are certain things that we can and can't restrict during public comment because it gets into issues of free speech in the constitution. I think the three minute limit is appropriate, um, but I'll call on you in one second and then you. Um, I'm just thinking, I guess it seems like it's sort of a gray area, murky as to whether committee members, how committee members are engaging with members of the public. I'll just say, as my discretion is the chair, I don't want to have us bickering back and forth across the line, like going out and saying, hey, you, blah, 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 blah. Right, let's avoid that as a committee. Let's not um, go out and randomly bicker with members of the public. But if you have questions, want to sort of pick someone's brain, have a dialogue, maybe encourage some community discussion, talk across the table. I don't see a problem with that. If other people, if it gets, you know, over the three minute, if it's within the three minute limit and the member of the public's okay with it, I'm not going to stop it. 
Meg? Just a follow-up. I assume that we wouldn't, if something huge came up and it wasn't on the agenda in lieu, related to a public comment, it would be appropriate to say, I'd like to put the subject, in this case of ranked choice voting or whatever, on our agenda for the next time, sort of to establish that it, there was a lot to say, but we're, we're not going to say it now because people aren't prepared. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, remind folks that there are many ways to communicate with the committee. Uh, you, you don't have to wait for a meeting and your your three minute and the three minute is an arbitrary limit uh, can be shortened. Um, you, you know, you 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 there's you know there's email uh, for everybody. There's phones if you've got the time. Uh, you, you can reach out in in other ways. Uh, you don't have the benefit of having your smiling face be on the local TV, but you know if you want to make your point across and you want to be precise and detailed, it's better to put it in writing uh, and, and, and get it off. That way, the other thing is, is that the chair can, I think, allow for comment from the public when you're discussing a particular item so that people who have interest in an item on the agenda can defer their comments from the rather than making them during the public comment period they could just let the chair know that they will be interested in talking about item three or item seven or something like that so that they, they there's a little bit more freedom there and you can go back and forth a little bit excellent this goes back to um just earlier about hybrid meetings that the suggestion has been made and I think is a good one is that they be full Zoom meetings so that everyone is here. We can see their faces and the people at the meeting can see the other faces there. I don't know if there's a technical reason that can't be done, but I guess so this is a webinar. Is that technically what we're doing? And so if there's a way that if we're going to not have the in-person, the advantages of in-person, we at least would um, have little boxes with with the faces of everyone here. Excellent. Thank you. I'd like to have, be intentional about developing a really positive committee culture. So for example, not texting each other during meetings or getting texts from, well, that's an issue with some committees, particularly with Zoom when you're home and nobody can tell what you're doing. So I just, uh, it's obviously a honor system that we won't, I don't want to say we'll all sign on the line that we won't text anybody, but um, just that kind of thing that would be intentional about the authenticity of our time together and not be distracted by people either texting each other. That's just one example, but this, that's the downside of Zoom is that um, it's it's not as visible. It's not as clear the, the quality of participation. I don't laugh at your comment. I laugh because I got a text from a member of the public as you were saying in your <laughs> So it's a question of where is your phone? <laughs> you know, well, I'm, yeah, it's just we have to, I think this kind of thing we have to be intentional about because the culture is so counter to that. Um, I mean, I've seen people texting during movies. Andy? Just uh, so we can inform folks, what is the email that people would use to communicate with this committee? That's mine. <laughs> My contact information is on your committee webpage. Um, it's up to you members if you want to share your email with members of the public um, and collect information that way. Your neighbors and friends and other members of the public might want to talk to you about your work and what you're doing. And that's perfectly appropriate to have those conversations and bring what you learn and what you hear back to the committee. So um, it's up to you how you share your email addresses. But if uh, someone wants to communicate something specifically to the committee, then they can email me um, and I can pass that on to you. Um, typically, the, the council's policy isn't to um, post all the emails we get. We have a feedback portal so that people can post their comments online. And that allows them to affirmatively say, yes, I'm OK with putting these comments on the website. Um, so if we want to look into doing something similar to that so that people can feel like they can see what other people are saying and so on, then um, I can look into that for this committee as well. Um, but 
our practice because we have to go back and redact personal information from those emails when they're shared. If there's a public records request or whatever, then uh, it, it's very cumbersome. So those, the feedback portal is a lot easier for me to manage and post the, the feedback. Um, to Meg's point, if I may, um, your text messages with committee members also are a public record. So I would caution you about talking about committee business via text as well. I wanted to say something about much like your, your text that you received just now. I mean, I've had grocery store conversations already with people who want to say, I want you guys to look at this, this, and this. I don't see myself as a conduit for anyone else. Um, because they brought that up to me at the grocery store, I don't feel compelled to bring it up to you. Um, I would consider, I would turn to them and say, this is something you need to send to the council or to the committee itself. Um, if, if I may, it's, yeah. It's up to individual members, what you hear and what, what ideas you hear that you want to bring up to the committee and what you don't. So, you know, that if you feel like, yeah, reach out and have public speak during public comment or email the committee, your comments or whatever, that's fine. Um, but you can also hear feedback and go, yeah, I like that idea. I'm going to bring it up or maybe not. Athena is the official place for your emails. Send emails to Athena. We'll all get them and read them. If you do want to email me, my email is onejrhines at gmail.com. Feel free to send me your concerns, but public comments go to Athena. Um, Erica, go ahead. Thank you. And if this question is better for next week, please let me know. But um, the idea of public comment is, is what's on the agenda. Um, and the methods that we're talking about are sort of um, a little bit like... Uh, the mo the more um passive ways to receive public comment like people just you know it's unsolicited people come and come to a meeting and talk about whatever they would like uh or email generally um thoughts about um the committee's work and so on to a gen a general email and my question is about more, if the committee decides to take on a more active um, pursuit of specific questions to direct to the public. Um, my question is, uh, what what methods are open to us and that are not just sort of passive, you know, receiving general comments, but just as, a, just as an example, and we don't have to take this on today if it's not appropriate for today, if we wanted to conduct a survey, if we wanted to put up um, uh, some sort of means online for people to, with our specific questions, to solicit specific feedback from the public about X, Y, Z issues, uh, are we able to do that independently of the methods that are the, the kind of standing email that's just available for anything that people want to talk about? Are we able to more actively solicit on specific questions through other means? Athena, I saw your hand and I honestly do not have a good answer. So go ahead. Well, I'm going to scold you both for not having read your charge <laughs> because because it does, the charge does speak to that. So your charge, one of the bullets in your charge is raise public awareness of the charter review process through various community outreach efforts, i.e. town websites, request community organizations to include information in their newsletters, et cetera, and also develop and deploy a variety of feedback mechanisms, i.e. surveys, invitations to testify, public meetings, focus groups, et cetera, throughout the review process. Next is analyze that feedback from the community prior to initial preliminary and final reports. Um, and you're also required to hold a public forum um, on your final report. So yes, absolutely, I agree. And your charge speaks to that, that public comment is one way to hear feedback from the community, but it's really gonna be incumbent on this committee to get out into the community and be active in that communication and feedback process with community members. Um, not only are these meetings less accessible to the public, but you really have to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in town hall to even know that these meetings are happening. Um, so I encourage you to think about ways that, you know, unfortunately we weren't able to meet before today, but the block party is today. That would have been an opportunity for us to table and share information and for you to get out there and start talking to people. But looking for those opportunities is going to be a great way to collect that feedback and have conversations in the community. And then more formal ways of getting out there and, you know, having meetings maybe out in the community is something that the, the committee could consider as well. I'm, great questions. Thank you. was excellent. Thank you. And I'm all in favor of having meetings, listening sessions, discussions, 
tabling. We don't have another block party, but events, et cetera. Um, if we want to table at, I'm happy to do that too. I think it's also important where if we're going to go canvassing or going to go hold community events to be equitable about it. I have been canvassing and holding community events for other organizations and have found that the message you get and the opinions of people in town politics can be very different depending on where you go geographically, racially, and economically in town. And I think that it's important we be equitable in our approaches to that. Go ahead. One caution. When you're speaking to a member of the committee, you are speaking to a member of the committee and not the committee as a whole. And I, I found this to be, unfortunately, um, people unfortunately may get into this misunderstanding. Uh, I've certainly discovered that as a member of the select board. I've certainly discovered that as members of other, a member of other committees or as an administrator to have someone come into my office and say, well, I talked to so-and-so and they said the planning board is, and I said, no, you talk to a member of the board. So if you're having discussions, please make it clear that you're talking to one person, you will do your best to convey that to the committee. Um, I would also um, suggest that if someone's going to be invited to testify uh, or to, to offer information to the committee as a whole, that, that that be announced in advance of that person showing up um, so that there can be some small screening by members of the committee to just to kind of ensure that who's ever gonna present is, um, is is going to do something that's relevant. Yeah. Meg, go ahead. I agree. Related to that and something that worked with the Charter Commission was if we have a meeting where we're going to discuss something big to let people know so that the, the attendance, you know, improves when people know what it is you're going to talk about rather than just come to a two-hour meeting and you're not quite sure what's going to come up. Those don't attract very many people. Yeah, Athena. Thank you. We have a terrific new communications manager here in town hall, um, and she's been really great at um, getting information out on social media, on the town website, and uh, thinking about ways that we can get out into the community and, and offer information and collect feedback that way. So um, I think I'm, I'm very excited to do this, this type of work and work with her about how we can share information about what the committee's doing um, in, a, in a more robust way. Yeah, I completely agree. And we could even, in addition to that, create our own Instagram account or our own social media, et cetera, um, to share what we're doing. We could also, no, people are opposed. <laughs> yeah, we just have to be careful about that. Okay. So, yeah. We'll, we'll, we can, we can. All right. That can be a, a, a future agenda item. I just <laughs> might have, um, I know I have a few different groups that we have accounts for, but regardless, other comments before we adjourn the meeting? Andy. Just to note that the Charter Commission did have its own Facebook page, so there's no reason. I mean, there wasn't any reason then not to have that, but it would need yeah. to be the stuff that goes on there would need to be approved by the committee. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Meg. I want to thank the temporary chair, <laughs> vice chair, for doing an excellent job without, you know, on, on the spot. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say one thing about public comment, which is for folks in the public, if you're issue is not on our agenda, we probably won't discuss it with you. If it is all within the three minute limit, uh, allow some discussion picking uh, of issues between members of the committee and the public if you are so interested to ask questions or that sort of thing. I welcome that. Athena, did you have your hand up earlier? I did. I did yeah, go quick, right ahead. A quick comment before I forget about uh, public comment on Zoom. So uh, one of you had suggested that you, you're able to see faces on Zoom. Because we set this up as a webinar, we do this specifically to avoid Zoom bombing. And to pat myself on the back, we haven't had many issues like that at the council because we manage meetings this way. In other communities who do meetings instead of webinars, anyone is allowed to come in and mute and unmute and share screens. And they've had really terrible experiences with that. Um, and also in terms of equity, some people have computers with a camera, some people are calling in, so we treat everyone the same. Um, so that's a, a mute and unmute function rather than allowing people to turn their cameras on and, and be on screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, that is important as well. Um, other questions, comments, um, next agenda, 
could you remind me like a general idea of what the next agenda might look like? Uh, my notes say uh, some legal advice, gathering questions, reviewing your charge and the parameters of what you're able to do and not do, um, looking into other community charter review reports. So I will begin looking at other communities, looking for those. If there are members who find those, they can send to me and I can share them out into the next meeting packet so that you have an opportunity to look at those before the next meeting and get an idea of what other communities are doing. Awesome. Um, I had, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, ranked choice voting was brought up today. Um, right. And then uh, procedural discussions about how you're going to take up your work. That's the, the list that I had. We could also have a discussion about like outreach and that um, both me social media outreach, but also like in-person outreach. That might be a good agenda item. Um, other than that, legal advice, I did have one question. We're not seeking any legal advice before that meeting. We'd be seeking it after that meeting. Is that correct? So I can um, work with the town manager to see, you know, what the best use of our resources is there. I think it might be helpful to have just a general memo about your scope and then request, you know, gather questions, um, and then we can put those together to request legal advice. But like I said, if we can do that kind of in a batch rather than ongoing questions to our legal counsel um, so that we're not racking up a bill that way. Yeah, I agree. And let's be creative about like using other resources given how costly it can probably be. Go ahead. So as an open meeting question, I mean, I will send you information I have, and I think it can be shared without any, this is just information, publicly available information. We can share that without uh, violating open meetings. Is that not true? Right. I can, I can pass information. Yeah, to the yeah, yeah. No, I found this a bunch of things I think that would, that would really be. No, uh, hang on. <laughs> you can, you can share information with committee members. I'd like to discuss this at the next meeting, but not, I think, or I feel so thoughts, ideas, opinions are not for email, but you, we can share documents. So documents that members would like me to post for the next meeting, you have a web page on the town site. Um, there's meeting packets for each, each meeting. I've sent you links to everything. Um, so for each meeting, you'll have a, a folder on the town website. Anything that I receive that you'd like to share with the committee in advance of the next meeting, I can put in the folder for the next meeting. Um, so you all have access to it. Members of the public have access to it. And then there was some discussion about, you know, a library or a repository of some information. I think I, I mentioned that in the one of the emails that we can have a conversation about how you'd like to organize those materials. If you'd like a separate fo folder for background materials or a separate folder for legal advice and a separate folder for public input. However, we want to organize that information so that it's, you know, clear what we're doing with it. Meeting packets, it's, you know, difficult to find. We got a legal advice and I have to remember which meeting we got it and which packets it's in. So um, I find that trying to organize things in a way that's logical and not necessarily chronological is Just helpful. sending documents and stuff that'll keep the emails nice and short and avoid violations so if we just want to send documents yeah. so, so any documents that you'd like to share at the next meeting you can send to me and i'll put them in the next meeting packet for discussion but please don't i right. think we should talk about this because okay uh meg then bernie um briefly for now but there's a large group of amherst residents who have studied our process the league of women voters and have a memo that went through a consensus process it was months of study of exactly what we're doing so i'd like to have at some point on the agenda down the road, a consideration of that piece of work, because it is a high level of participation in our process that dozens of people participated in. But I don't think we're ready. I just want to, I'm sure it'll be sent to everyone, but not by me, but. Meg, if you'd like to send it to me, I can put it in a meeting packet. Okay. Yeah. I just don't, I want it to be at the right time, not rushed necessarily at the beginning, but it's yeah. very detailed. And I'm not sure I support every single thing in it. Uh, but I'm not advocating that. I'm just thinking a group of, we want meaningful participation. A large number of our residents worked on this that we, sh we should be giving it some serious attention. Absolutely. Yeah, Bernie? Yeah, I was just going to say that if, if you're going to send material for, and Vina says she's going to put it in the packet, that means it's going on the website. It's public. <laughs> So you you can't send us a secret report from that you found on, you know, um, fixyourgovernment.com. You know, you, you have to, it, it, it's it's there. 
Um, the other thing is, is I forget the term, but to keep um, keep in mind that you can do by email nuts and bolts stuff. I can meet on this day. I can't meet on this day. You need me to sign a letter. I'll be in on Thursday. You know that kind of uh, that 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 kind of of uh, uh, administrative uh, duties are, are okay. But if you want to express your opinion, sorry. <laughs> Alrighty, Andy. So our next meeting will be primarily about how we want to do our work. Is that it's sort of you know, the, you know, we'll, we'll hear our chart, we'll get our charge again, and then we can talk about these issues of how we're going to collect information and, you know, will we'll we get down to more of the nuts and bolts of how we're going to do the work? That's right? what it seems. Yeah. Given the agenda, that's what it seems. And I think that's a good appropriate time for that, so to speak. Um, oh, I had something to say completely. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have touched upon this earlier. Um, is everybody okay with first name basis? Is that like, yeah. yeah, great. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. Um, comments, questions before we adjourn? Seeing none. Do I seek a motion a second and adjourn? Okay, great. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Great, second. Um, great, perfect, anybody. Um, and roll call vote? Yes. Got it. Um, so I'll do this quickly so we can get out of here. Uh, Erica. Yes. Um, Bernie. Yes. Dan. Yes. Andy. Yes. Uh, Ken. Yes. Meg. Yes. Myself. Uh, yes. We're adjourned. Um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.